Pioneer. Pioneer is a program of innovative orthopedic networking, e-learning, education, and research that was designed to fill the gap left by the absence of face-to-face -face meetings, courses, and other activities during the 2020 coronavirus pandemic. But Pioneer has become so much more than this in the intervening year. Pioneer is a virtual, but also very real community of like-minded orthopedists striving to help not only themselves, but one another. With the latest video conferencing and educational technology, as well as a groundbreaking online platform, SICOT's pioneer events, activities, and resources are reaching every corner of the globe. With over 55,000 views of our webinars so far, we're forging new partnerships, signing agreements with 12 other international academic societies, and building an enduring network we hope will last for many years to come. So, what can you expect from us? Free webinars led by key opinion leaders from around the world and across all fields of orthopedic surgery and traumatology, as well as chat shows with some of the most interesting and inspiring surgeons on the planet. Opportunities to take an interactive role in these webinars by participating in polls and live discussions. Free on-demand Pioneer playback service. Watch our webinars again and again in your own time. And coming soon. Our new bespoke learning management system will host podcasts, an online version of the famous SICOT diploma exam, virtual training modules, surgical technique courses, a discussion forum, and much, much more. We hope you'll join us on this pioneering journey as we push the boundaries of what is possible in online orthopedic education together. Good day, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from wherever you are around the world. Welcome to the next edition of Sikot Pioneer. We have an interesting program that is the single biggest practice change in my orthopedic speciality in a decade. This program is brought to you by Sikot Pioneer along with a collaboration with the Nepal Orthopedic Association. Dr. Ramesh Prasad Singh is coordinating this program from Nepal. We have the best of minds from around the world, from UK, from the Australia, Argentina, and Switzerland. Welcome everyone to this very interesting program. I would like to request Dr. Peter Kanuda from the UK to talk about his experience in the hip. Dr. Peter is a high volume lower limb arthroplasty surgeon working in the Wales, UK. He has a PhD from Sweden. He was awarded the Hip Society Rothman Ranawat Traveling Fellowship in 2021 and has special interest in revision hip and knee surgery. Over to Dr. Peter. Good morning. Um, can you see my screen? Good morning. Um, Good morning or good afternoon, Nepal. Um, and thank you for the invitation. So um, I would like to share some of my ideas about the single biggest practice change in the de in the last decade. And um, just before we start, you know, you can't just do it like this. So I've got some conflict of interest, non-relevant for this talk. 
But if you try to shortlist these type of things, you know, what can we talk about? We can talk about robotics and technologies. We can talk about the spinal pelvic relationship. We can talk about enhanced recovery, short stay, new bearing, the new old approach, which is the anterior approach, register or patient reported outcome measures. And we're talking about the operation of the century. But also, there are still some questions of how to prove the value of the operation. But the right question to be asked, to be asked is how to improve the value of the operation of the century, because we know that it's very a very good operation. So I thought that enhanced recovery after surgery was the uh, object to talk about. And first of all, what do patients expect from their new hip and their procedure? First of all, no pain, a very quick recovery, return to pre-disease status, long-lasting excellent results, and minimal risks. But how can we achieve that? So if you look at um, the origins of the Enhanced Recovery Society, it all started with Henry Kellett. Uh, on around 2001, the uh, Enhanced Recur uh, Recovery after, after Surgery Society was started, but it started before that. And it started because um, Mr. Professor Kellett wasn't very happy with the outcomes of his surgery. He felt that the patients weren't getting the best deal. So they developed a multimodal care pathway based on evidence to improve practice. And Professor Fearon from the UK and Professor Jungfist from, from the Scandinavia was, were really instrumental in setting all of this up. It wasn't a rigid protocol, but a method based on consensus guidelines. And it's also known nowadays as rapid recovery or fast track surgery. So it has got some um, other terms, but it's all saying the same thing. Enhanced recovery, rapid recovery or fast track surgery. I was very lucky to be invited in one of the first meetings where I took my team and you can see one my anesthetist with Professor Kellett having some discussions over coffee. And it's quite important to have your team involved in, in the development of your enhanced recovery after, after surgery uh, protocols. So we've also seen a ripple effect, not only geographically. So it started in Scandinavia, went to the Netherlands, went to the States, the UK and across the world, but also in specialty. And with an, with an orthopedics, it started with the hips and the knees, but also now hip fracture surgery, as well as lumbar surgery, as well as ACL surgery. And in most countries, they've got an enhanced recovery society, um, sub-society. So what is it all about? So it's got three, three distinct uh, areas. So we talk about the preoperative, the perioperative, and the postoperative uh, area. So preoperative information counseling, optimization of the patient fasting, perioperative standardized anesthetic protocols, local infiltration analgesia or nerve blocks, avoiding of nausea and vomiting, making sure the patient's normal thermic, prevention of blood loss, good fluid management, and uh, making sure the surgical factors are as ideal as possible. And then postoperatively, we need to make sure that the patient gets multimodal analgesia, early mobilization, criteria-based discharge. And what we need to do is we need to make sure that we continuously improve our, our cycle and make sure that the post-op nutritional care is also excellent after surgery. So what have we found? So we, let's talk about evidence-based medicine and, and hip replacement. And we, we talk about hip replacement, the total hip replacement, or the hemiarthroplasty uh, for for hip fractures. So um, both, both of the columns are some consensus statements. One of them is for the elective surgery and developed by uh, Dr. Wainwright from Southampton. And the second one is from Dr. Samir, um, which lives far closer to you, uh, but I found this in a, a very, very nice article. So three three distinct areas, pre and peri and post-operatively, and you can say it's, it's almost the same. Um, however, with the hip fractures, early, early time to surgery is, is quite important as well. So if you look at hip fracture surgery and enhanced recovery, so who's endorsing it? So I, I presumably all know that the national uh, hip fracture database in the UK is, is very is very active, looking at all our results. So they've endorsed it. The American College of Surgeons have endorsed it, and there's quite a number of systematic reviews and meta analysis that are supporting all of all of these changes that we've made in the past. And what about the elective total hip replacement? So these are the consensus recommendations. They were uh, published in the Acta Orthopedica. Um, they're based on an um, MDT, multidisciplinary team, panel of experts, surgeons, physicians, anesthetic colleagues, and physiotherapists. They did a critical appraisal of the literature and consensus, great assessed the evidence, great assessed the strength of recommendation. And there were 17 topics of interest and all supported by the ERA Society. So we've got a unified protocol there. And I would suggest you try to find this and, and use it in your practice as a guideline. You don't have to um, do everything it says, but it's just, you know, just the basis of your changes in your in your protocols. So are we talking about evidence-based medicine? Uh, we, we really do, because it, it, it started as a patient-centered science, 
uh, based on clear pathophysiological business principles, and it should not be replaced by uncertain scientific approaches that seek to replace two measures of recovery, such as complications, readmissions, and quality of life of length of stay. So what we're talking about is we try to reduce the complications, we try to reduce the readmissions and improve the quality of life with a short length of stay. And the short length of stay is easy for our management teams to, to measure, um, but it's really about reducing the complications, readmissions, and improving the quality of life for our patients. And Kellett very recently said you know, there is still some room for improvement and some of the data and some of the um, guidance we might have to critically reanalyze uh, which component components are the most important. And, you know, is the post-discharge functional recovery, is this really what we're talking about? If we then talk about value-based healthcare, you know, the World Health Organization drives to improve our value in healthcare. And value means outcome that match, matter to the patients and reducing costs. So less pain, quicker recovery and less costs, quicker return to breathing status um, is all very important to get to increase the value. And an enhanced recovery, we know, does not negatively affect long-term outcomes as, as uh, proven by studies. Less complications, less adverse events and less readmissions all help to increase the value and reduce the cost um, in, in, this, in my view. Um, but what about the patient experience? So Wang uh, did a study uh, looking at the patient experience and uh, he did a systematic review and qualitative analysis. Uh, he used critical analysis of 31 studies, very heavy, uh, concentrated in Europe and the, the United States and Canada. And four of them were about hip and knee replacement. So they looked at the structure, the process and the outcome. And the outcome, the most important outcome was improving the severe post-operative symptoms of our patients. So improving their experience overall following their surgery. However, there were some issues with it, and I'll get back to that later. But what about the star of experience? Well, the star of experience, in my view, and in the literature view, is complex and challenging. So if you want to get your staff on board, they need to understand the enhanced recovery principles and guidelines. You need to communicate within the team and within the patients, and you need to provide them with a comprehensive, coherent, and local relevant uh, protocol that, that, is, that is possible for your patients. And if you identify and recruit local enhanced recovery after surgery champions, you can get there. So the improvements of the enhanced um, pathway will be implementing and delivery. Those two factors are extremely important to get to get things done. So if you then talk to patients and and staff members, uh, there are still some problems with uh, pain management. Um, some of us haven't got that perfectly, and patients or some patients are different. So whilst you might have a guideline, an overall guideline, you sometimes you'll have to deviate from it for for single patients, especially the patients that are uh, using quite a bit of morphine prior to coming in. There's sometimes a lack of continuous medical support uh, that the patients are feeling. There's inconsistent information and information not tailored to the patient. Care support at home sometimes lacks late referrals for surgery, and especially in, in our country, in the UK, we got a long wait in the snow, which is which is in, um, decreasing our satisfaction rate and access to support and resources for our patients after surgery. There is some proof that it's working. I would like to refer you to the thesis of um, Urban Berge uh, from Gothenburg. He feels that it's safe. There's certainly no increase in readmissions adverse events. Prompts at least as good as conventional and even a little bit better. But a focus on the period after discharge is very important to improve further recovery, improve patient satisfaction and improve functional outcome. It is very important to make sure that all of this is done, keeping the patient cent uh, central in, in the process. So what is the future now of enhanced recovery and what are the links? So first of all, we need to make sure that we try to get a standardization of care over the complete pathway. And the standards of care might be different in different countries, but we need to get it, get it, get that right. And whilst improving the outcome and reducing the direct and indirect cost, we need to keep the principles of value-based healthcare, you know, reducing, reducing the cost and certainly improving the outcomes for the patients. We need to make sure that we stay with the true evidence-based practice. Evidence-based medicine is extremely important. And if you get all of that right, and if you have got uh, all these all these support structures correct, then I think day case surgery uh, will become more and more possible. And in some surgical centers in the United States, 80% of their uh, joints are going home the same day. This is certainly not the case in our country and most probably not the case in Nepal. But, you know, if we get it all right and if the geographical uh, circumstances are correct, this is what we can, what we could achieve in, in the future. So in conclusion, enhanced recovery is patient center, but needs a team-based approach. You need to check the evidence and relate back to your own practice and see what is what is good for your own practice and what is practical to, to implement. You need to evalu evaluate and adapt for local situation and keep on evaluating, keep on adapting to make it better. 
And you have to try to get an enhanced recovery over the complete pathway. So that means from referral um, to the, the when the patient gets discharged. And if you get all that right, then day case surgery is the ultimate embodiment of enhanced recovery. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, now or later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Peter. That was a very crisp and clear presentation on what is making the news and replacement surgeries of the hip and what we should work towards. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Ramesh, do we have any questions from the audience in Nepal? Do you have any questions from anyone in the audience? I think th there is no question, so yeah. we should continue with yeah. the presentation. Yeah. You go ahead. You go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, so the next talk is going to be on the single biggest practice change in foot and ankle by Dr. Arvind Puri. Dr. Arvind Puri is foot and ankle surgeon from Keynes, Australia. He is the president of the foot and ankle section of Asia Pacific Orthopedic Association and the vice chair of the SICOT foot and ankle committee. He is also secretary of the Queensland Australian Orthopedic Association. Welcome Dr. Arvind Puri, over to you. Thank you very much, Sasi, for that uh, introduction. I'll share my screen. Now, uh, can you see the um, presentation? Yes, yeah. Okay, thank you. Now, thank you very much to Nepal Orthopedic, to Ramesh, to Vikas, yourself, Sassi, for giving this opportunity to present on a very interesting topic that has been selected by the CCOT and the Pioneer um, uh, system. Now, in terms of foot and ankle, as you know, it has been for long a very, very neglected subspeciality, which more recently, in the last maybe a decade or so, has become one of the fastest growing and progressive specialities in orthopedics. And along with all the recent research, the new implants, the new methods of fixation and dealing with trauma, the new surgeries to deal with the elective operation has also resulted in the acceptance and perhaps acknowledgement of how high the incidence of wound infection, wound healing is in foot and ankle surgery. Up to 18% is the number that is quoted. So my talk is on how we would try or we have tried and in the last decade made some really leaps and bounds towards trying to improve the wound healing, to improve the outcomes without having to get into trouble with infection and all. So the title is the shortcuts are better. I know this is not the taught thing, but in my case, in this presentation, shortcuts are definitely better. So we have always seen this. We've all been, unfortunately, been at the end where our patients have come to us after having done a good surgery with a wound, just, just fails to heal or breaks down, gets infected, requires numerous surgeries. And it's an uphill task for the patient and for us to try and get them a reasonably good outcome when the start is so bad. So the big question is, why is it so much, so much more common in the foot and ankle subspeciality. And the reasons are patient factors. You know, you know, we have patients who've got diabetes, patients who might be immunocompromised, patients with peripheral vascular problems, patients who are on certain medications, smokers, alcoholics. All these patient factors can jeopardize and hinder the healing of the wounds and land the patient and yourself in some trouble. Then the soft tissue in trauma, especially in foot and ankle, whether it's a pilon fracture, a bad ankle fracture, a list frank injury, a dislocation of the talus or subtalar joint or periarticular dislocations. These are all situations where the soft tissue in the foot is damaged to such an extent that to try and attempt to perform surgery through that own load is fraught with danger. Then there's the anatomical and functional factors. Anatomical like angiosomes, 
the supply of the blood vessels to the foot, which parts of the foot are supplied by which blood vessels, and the functional factors. The foot, as you know, is a dependent part of the body, and so it has always has prolonged incidence of swellings, stiffness, difficulty in physiotherapy. Of course, surgical factors. It is absolutely imperative that soft tissues are dealt with in a very, very delicate fashion. And then the true post-op care, where the foot is rested as it deserves to be after any major surgery on it. Now, numerous studies have been done, and it's quite clear that peripheral vascular disease is a very common and a very important cause for trouble with wound healing. And the other risk factors that I've mentioned about the patient in both elective and trauma in the patient are something that you need to extract from the history of the patient to then decide how you will approach the problem that you're faced with. So angiosomes is a concept where three arteries supply six portions of the foot. Each of them have a designated area and this helps in deciding if you, the plastics need to provide some wound cover. This helps to decide which incisions are likely to heal better, and especially at the junctions of the angiosome distribution areas, the healing of the sur surgical incisions is always a lot better. Now, we are all familiar with this. We have all done in the past Achilles tendon uh, repairs through fairly long incisions, exposed the tendon, repaired it, been quite happy with it, but at the end of the day, patients have not been known to have a smooth sailing. They can have wound breakdowns, which are very, very difficult to treat. As the oxygen saturation in that part of the foot has been shown to be low, especially if the foot is placed in a plant affection. So what is the changes in the last decade to address these problems? So in Achilles tendon, a mini incision is certainly something that all of us can do, whether we are in Australia or in Nepal, or in Sweden, it doesn't matter. A smaller incision focused on the side of where the Achilles tendon is ruptured, either clinically, ultrasound, MRI, whichever way you have found out, and taking full thickness flaps, incising the paratinon, elevating it as a separate layer, repairing the tendon, which can be pulled distally and proximally, depending on which stump you're dealing with, with Krakow sutures can give you enough exposure to repair well and not have too big a wound over that Achilles tendon, which puts them at risk. We are all familiar with the old lateral extensile approach to fix calcaneal fractures. And who amongst us has not seen this wound in the corner break down and give a lot of grief to us? We are always pleased with the fixation, but the wound is always something that terrorizes us. So, the progress that has been made in the last decade is to try and address the calcaneal fractures through a much smaller, shorter incision called the sinus tarsi approach, which is an incision from the tip of the fibula towards the fourth metatarsal. And all you do is incise the skin, find the brevis, extensor brevis muscle, lift it off, and you're pretty much right there, peroneal tendons and into the subtilar area where you can see the posterior facet of the calcaneus elevated and fix it using certain instruments like the dissection tool you see on the picture there. That helps to elevate the soft tissue of the lateral wall of the calcaneus, allows you to put specific plates which may or may not have an extension on it through that small sinus tarsi using one of the jigs that is provided and fix the fracture reasonably well with not too many issues in relation to the healing of the wound. Now the same, so here is an x-ray intraoperatively of the dissection tool used to lift the soft tissue off the lateral wall of the calcaneus and then the final fixation of the fracture itself. Now we can also use the same incision and a small mini anterior incision to not only do an ankle fusion but also subtear. And through two small simple incisions, you can also then fix or fuse the, the triple arthrodesis. So through very small incision, which give you access to what you have to do using the right instruments, whether it's the bird that you use or an osteotome to, to pay the surfaces, you can still protect the soft tissue and get a reasonably good fixation or fusion that you're attempting to do.
So here is a picture of what I do for the ankles. Either I use two small incisions, one on the medial, one on the lateral, or one mini incision on the anterior aspect of the ankle joint to gain access to the ankle, prepare it, fix it with some calorie screws, and then put a detensioning plate in front of the ankle itself. And that has worked really well, rather than a large incision from the front. Of course, if the ankle is very, very de deformed, you need to use the larger incisions. So here's an example of fixation using a small incision from the interior aspect and two headless compression screws. But what is in store for us? We already know that MIS or minimally invasive surgery has become more or less mainstream, though it is not as popular in all the regions around the world due to the costs that are associated with it. Essentially, it means you use percutaneous incisions and instrumentation which allows you to do extra articular osteotomies for correction of, for example, hallux valgus, hammer toes, performing Wilds osteotomies, removing some dorsal bumps, or performing the calcaneal lateral or varizing osteotomy, all through very small incisions and then percutaneously stabilizing them to gain a better uh, outcome with less wound problems. The other issue in the last decade that has really made a big difference and will, I think, in the future continue to do so is the ankle arthroscope. Now, ankle arthroscope was initially diagnostic, but has more recently, in the last few years, become very useful in dealing with OCDs, lateral ligament reconstructions, and dealing with a lot of medial or tendon issues as well. So I think that in the future, Arthroscopy will take on a bigger and bigger role in dealing with problems of the ankle. So in, 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 in the end, I think patient selection is important. You have to get a good history, be sure about the vascular status and other risk factors. You have to preoperatively plan how you're going to perform small incision or MIS surgery. You have to respect the soft tissues. Delicate handling is imperative. The closure of all these wounds should be tension-free and post-op instructions should be clearly stated, requiring the patient to follow them as best as they can to hope for a good outcome. Well, thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Puri, for your excellent presentation. Is there any question from the audience? Is there any question? Anyone? Or should we continue with the next talk? Okay, Dr. Sashi, sure. let's continue sure. with the next talk. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Puri. It was very clear and infection is something that we never want in any region of our body. And uh, we have to note that the foot and ankle are very prone for infection and definitely we have to take precautions for it. Thank you very much for your presentation. We The next presentation or talk will be on the single biggest practice change in shoulder and technology. We have Dr. Daniel Moya with us. Dr. Daniel Moya is orthopedic and shockwave treatment specialist at Hospital Britannica, the Buenos Aires in Argentina. He is past president of the Argentinian Shoulder and Elbow Surgery Association and the International Society for Medical Shockwave Treatment and the Latin American Shoulder and Elbow Society. He is also the current chair of the SICOT Shoulder and Elbow Committee. Welcome, Dr. Daniel Moya. Over to you. Thank you very much. It is a pleasure to be part of this uh, webinar and my greetings for our colleagues in Nepal. My task is to present you uh, the innovations related to shoulder surgery and I will speak about uh, shockwave technology uh, as well. But let's begin with shoulder. About 30 years ago, Charles Rockwood defined that the subspeciality of shoulder uh, surgery was going through a true explosion of interest. And this was based on the exponential growth, uh, not only in knowledge, but also in education offer. Uh, many years later, we can say that this phenomenon has not stopped. There are many things going on on shoulder uh, surgery. Uh, 
For instance, publications related to our subspeciality represent around uh, 100% of the most uh, frequently cited papers in orthopedic scientific literature, uh, with the peculiarity of having an author as Charles Neer, uh, who has been uh, three times placed on this list. Um, it has been defined as a game changer, an event, idea, or procedure that affects a significant shift in the current way of doing or thinking about something. Uh, in the last 10 years, many innovations could be included in this definition in the field of shoulder surgery, so it, it is difficult to choose one. So I decided to ask help to my friends, to my colleagues, and I uh, conducted a survey amongst uh, shoulder surgeons from Latin America, uh, around 500 that participated in, in three chats uh, related to shoulder surgery. And you can see that uh, reverse shoulder arthroplasty was a massive choose, but, uh, uh, chosen, but it is a big dispersion. There is not only one option. So uh, let's uh, understand that there is a big growth of indications of uh, reverse shoulder arthroplasty around the world in the last 10 years. And uh, this should be placed perhaps as the most uh, innovation, the, the, the innovation that has given us the biggest impact. Uh, but uh, to have a more global approach, I asked the opinion of my uh, fellow colleagues in the International Board of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery. And uh, we can see here the opinion of our president, Dr. Joseph Ayanotti, a very well-known sur shoulder surgeon, and he chose a uh, computer-based 3D planning that is having really a big impact in our um, subspeciality and also included non-traditional office-based care. Uh, so we can see that uh, perhaps there are some options that are developed in uh, specific countries that perhaps they are not uh, globally uh, present in our practice, but should be considered. Dr. Levine also uh, preferred reverse shoulder arthroplasty as the first option. Let's move to Asia. Uh, Dr. Ying Yong Park uh, has stressed the importance of the biceps, uh, of using the biceps uh, in, in the tenotomy that we have used for many years, but also to reinforce rotator cuff repairs. Dr. Philippe Collin from France, he is nowadays the president of the European Shoulder and Elbow Society, has stressed the importance of regional anesthesia. So uh, we can see that it is not only a surgical procedure that was mentioned amongst the list of options. Um, Dr. Hiro Sugaya, pa past president of the Japanese Shoulder Society, uh, again, uh, has considered reverse shoulder arthroplasty the best option. Uh, Dr. Osvandere Lech, uh, former president of the um, International Board of Shoulder and Nervous Surgery, has stressed again uh, reverse shoulder arthroplasty. He speaks about the era of reverse shoulder arthroplasty, but it is interesting that he also pointed out that uh, there was an end for some procedures like single acromioplasty or even the use of hemi-arthroplasty that was really popular uh, 20 or 30 years ago. And he also mentioned the educational level, the webinars that became a very important tool uh, as we are uh, uh, experimenting now, and uh, life surgery in shoulder events. The organizer of the next International Congress in Canada, Dr. George Adwell, uh, also considered reverse shoulder arthroplasty, but we can see that in a country in which there is more experience for many years using the reverse shoulder arthroplasty, he chose a specific procedure, and he stressed the importance of the augmented reverse shoulder arthroplasty base plates. What about C-Cold Shoulder and Elbow Committee? Well, we have a poll, a poll and a preoperative surgical planning was the first election 
Surprisingly, reverse shoulder arthroplasty does not appear here in this list. So we can see that reverse shoulder arthroplasty can be considered the uh, procedure with the biggest impact in our practice in the last 10 years. And there are some other options like preparative planning and the use of the biceps uh, for uh, augmentation in repair of rotator cuff. I was also surprised that there are some options that were absent in the responses, the use of PRP, the use of high hyaluronic acid, and the use of stem cells. Besides their the, the popularity in marketing and in the social media, no surgeon uh, answer something related to regenerative medicine. Uh, what about technology? I will say some few words about shockwaves. Shockwaves is a technique that is uh, frequently underestimated and not well understood in the world of orthopedics. Uh, it is based in mechanotransduction, that is the ability of cells to uh, recognize a mechanical force and respond with biology. Uh, and uh, these uh, in, have a big influence in healing process. Back in 2018, we were able to present uh, an update on this technique and um, give grades of recommendation based on uh, the literature, on, on the medical evidence. And we can see that in several pathologies, uh, this technique uh, is a very good indication. In my personal practice, uh, this procedure has prevented me from uh, sending patients to the orthopedic room in many cases. For instance, in calcifications of the rotator cuff that as you can see, before and after the use of three sessions of shock waves, uh, there is no need for surgery. Uh, we also use this procedure for non-unions. You can see this lady uh, on the left, uh, it was a revision surgery of a uh, fracture of the hip, and one year after the revision surgery, there was no healing. Uh, after three sessions of shock waves, Three months later, uh, you can see the uh, callus formation and the pain disappear. Uh, to finish, this is an amazing um, demonstration of the force of mechanotransduction. This was, uh, again, a lady 18 months after a failed arthrodesis of the hallux with pain and uh, one of the screws was broken. Uh, just with three sessions of shock waves, you can see how the, there was a healing the, of the non-union, and in this case, the uh, symptoms completely disappeared. So, uh, in many cases, I have seen in the last 10 years that the use of this non-invasive, and sometimes for us surgeons, uh, we underestimate non-invasive procedures, but it, it, at the end of the day, we are doctors and we need to use the less aggressive option to treat our patients and to give a good result. Uh, so in, in my practice, is a, a good option. Is a, I think it's a disruptive technology and uh, we are at disposition to all who want to get closer to this uh, technique uh, uh, can get in touch with me and we will uh, try to help you and give the inform you the information. So learning points are that uh, going back to show the pathology, there was no clear consensus. On the contrary, there was a wide variety of opinions. Uh, there were geographical, generational, and e educational influence in the responses. Um, regenerative treatment were not included uh, as options uh, by the, all the, the surgeons that give a response. And finally, uh, shock wave treatment is a well-proven medical option uh, in our uh, specialty. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Dr. Moya. That was a very clear uh, status presentation on shoulder and technology. It is very much essential that we keep trying to get better and better. And it's also very important that we get updated with what is the latest in technology. And uh, uh, Shockwave is a very important tool in the management of a lot of um, issues of the wound. I will come to certain questions that I have at the end of the program. Dr. Ramesh, do you have uh, any questions from the audience? No, I think uh, we don't have any questions yeah. from the local yeah. here. So you can continue with the fourth speaker. Yes, you go ahead. So finally, we have Dr. Michael Tuban to talk about the single biggest practice change in trauma. Dr. Michael Tuban is a board certified trauma surgeon working at the Department of Traumatology at the University Hospital of Zurich, Switzerland. He has a PhD and is training in the Netherlands, Aachen, Germany, and Zurich. He has more than 70 publications and is a co author of Revised German S3 Guidelines in Polytrauma. His clinical focus is on polytrauma and minimally invasive spine, pelvic, and arthroplasty surgeries. Over to Dr. Tuban. Yes, good Good morning, um, afternoon, or um, evening for some part of the audience. Um, first of all, I would like to uh, thank the CECOT and the working group for a uh, kind invitation and uh, the excellent organization. Um, and if someone asks me, um, what are key developments in my field, um, pelvic and spine surgery, in contrast to the other speakers today, this question is pretty easy to answer. For me, that is the introduction of minimal invasive and navigated surgery. Um, however, it's it's not so easy to describe developments um, in the last 10 years within just 10 minutes. And it even becomes more difficult um, if we go back much further in time. So we go back to the 1400s um, because navigation didn't start in the operation room. It's, um, it started for people to, um, to get orientation um, on sea and on land. And um, this is the first example of navigation, it's the sextant. And then in, um, let's say, uh, 1600s, 1700s, some centuries later, Mr. Zagi from Osaka was the first to introduce some basic communication using um, electromagnetic waves. And by measuring the waves that bounce back, a position could be determined more specifically, but still not in the operation room. Then, um, some years later, General Motors um, used satellite-free orientation and navigation uh, that became available in the automotive industry. And eventually, um, GPS was adapted from the military and introduced into the civil world. And additionally, another uh, important, um, more local navigation tool that was developed was the development of parking sensors, um, which were um, from the beginning on um, based on ultrasound feedback. Then later on, there was less unidirectional uh, electromagnetic park sensors. And in, um, two th in the early 2000s, there was really a 360 degree around um, monitor view. And... Um, if you want to transfer these things into into our uh, into theater, it's also important to look at um, the developments in um, in medicine and in trauma surgery. And of course, if you want to do navigation, it starts with imaging. We all know that the X-ray was developed. Then later on, in the late 1980s, um, CT and brain stereotaxy was developed. And then um, in at about uh, 1999, um, the first interventions interoperative with direct feedback me uh, mechanisms uh, were applied in the operation room. And then in 1995, there were some initial reports about screw placement with navigation. And then in 2004, robotic has been um, has been introduced. So, in fact, everything fine, nothing can go wrong. But um, as with car sensors, navigation is also not 100% reliable. And um, you also have to take this into consideration. If we go to, uh, to my field, pelvic trauma, then what's the question? What's the current situation? Um, for instance, in our institution. Um, as we all know, CT scans became uh, the gold standard and is therefore available in most, uh, most pelvic cases. Although still some specific conditions like unstable patients um, are indications for conservative imaging, but they are associated with low sensitivity, um, uh, sensibility um, rates, and um, therefore we abandoned um, conventional imaging as primary diagnostic in stable patients and for all our pelvic cases um, where it's possible, we have optimal CT um, imaging. 
And this, of course, allows for planning uh, your reduction, your fixation, and if um, and if you really need, you can even plan a, the exact corridor, how you want to put your screws in, where you want to have them, and you can even plan some fancy screws, which are um, almost not possible without navigation. Um, we use sacroiliac screws for uh, posterior pelvic stabilization in most patients, in fr uh, fragility fracture, but also in bigger trauma. Um, and we prefer to get two screws in because that uh, results in better uh, stability. The downside of two screws is if you um, if you do two things at the same time, you multiply the risk of failure, and um, the S2 corridor is more difficult um, um, to get your screws in because it's a bit smaller and has a more difficult shape in some patients. And also our patients are changing, they are getting older, um, at least in our part of the continent, and we get more age-related or um, pathology-related deformations. Uh, like these cases where it's really difficult to get a screw in, um, even with navigation. And um, we also um, realized this like 10 years ago, we did a study where we were not totally happy with our results um, regarding um, uh, the results of non-navigated um, screw placement with uh, fluoroscopy. We had a screw malpositioning and nerve lesion rate combined of about 15%. And what we did, we were considering um, using our um, 3D imaging and um, uh, planning and um, apply navigation in the operation room. And this is how we do it today. Um, here we see the, uh, the surgeon on the left-hand side. Uh, we see a monitor. We see a docking station um, where we get our direct feedback. And in the back, we see an O-arm scan, which, uh, which is transferred over the patient and put in place to get, um, uh, to get your initial imaging. Then we make a CT scan, um, and before we do that, we put a reference marker here on the on the iliac crest with uh, two small pins of, of 10 centimeters and a skin incision of um, of one centimeter. And as we have heard that uh, smaller cuts are better, I totally agree with that. Um, these are um, still really small cuts for a very big injury. Then the CT device is put in, uh, into position. We checked all the sensors, which is on the on the right side. Uh, if they're all in the middle of the um, uh, of the screen, uh, you can do your scan, and then you can start doing uh, the navigation. Um, first, you do some calibration of your drill guide and your your pointer, which are devices uh, that gives you direct feedback where you are, um, if you are at the bone or if you're um, and in what position you are, and also at what position your uh, screws or um, um, uh, wires will end up. And this is how it looked like. Uh, we make a skin incision and, uh, and we put our guide, uh, our drill guide in, and then we select appropriate views and try if we get into the corridor we planned uh, preoperatively. And at the end, after putting the drill guides in, and you're not 100% sure if it's uh, if it's the perfect condition, you can do another uh, CT scan. And um, we tend to do more um, uh, low definition, um, or not high D scans anymore, because they also get really good um, uh, good results. And then you can put your uh, put your screws in, like here with the S1, S2 screw, and the um, retrograde uh, Remus uh, screw. And if you're done, you can um, you can continue with um, 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 with checking your position. You can uh, you can check directly after making another CT scan um, the length of your screws. If you're at the um, um, at the position where you, where you are, if they are in um, deep enough, and then you can continue with your next uh, small cut, uh, for instance here with the Ramus screw, or you can do the same uh, the same at the spine. Um, and we uh, we did a, a short investigation where we asked like 360 trauma surgeons from 83 countries around the world um, what their practices are in the treatment of um, pelvic ring surgeries that require surgery. And we found that 93% um, did use or make a preoperative 3D scan, which means that in potentially they can also make uh, do or use navigation. Percutaneous techniques were used in about 60% of cases. But if we look at uh, the use of 3D navigation, I think we still don't have the ripple effect, uh, as we saw with ERAS, where Professor Knud was talking about, because only 15% of cases are being treated by, uh, by 3D navigation. And I think in our hospital, it's over half of the cases. And um, what are the results if we compare um, O-arm with, uh, with conventional naviga or navigated surgery with fluoroscopy um, interventions? I will run over some, uh, some short papers. Um, we see that there is a maximal diversion of the um, um, of the um, of the actual screw compared to the planned screw of only 1.5 millimeters, which is really really small. Then we have an operation time for two screws of 71 minutes. 
Um, there are no complications um, documented in 20 cases um, 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 from others um, with only SI screws. And then if we look at the time difference, um, how long does the interventions take? Also there, there are no differences between um, conventional and navigated interventions. And if you look at radiation exposure, uh, we see that there is a bit uh, higher in conventional than in navigated. And especially um, if you consider that most patients also get uh, post-operative CT scanning um, if something um, is, if they are a bit unsure. And um, in the dysmorphic sacrum, there are additional studies on it. We saw that um, in normal sacrum that there are no misplaced screws with navigation uh, versus 12% in conventional and especially in the dysmorphic um, situation, there are two times more misplaced screws in um, um, uh, without navigation and with uh, with navigation. This is um, uh, just to conclude our experience. We compared uh, about 170 patients in a short uh, short time period that were treated, X-ray versus navigator screws, and in line with literature, we also found that in uh, navigation there were no um, uh, screw misplacements versus 11% in fluoroscopy group. Reoperation rates were significantly um, lower as well. And if we look at radiation exposure, we see more or less the same. Um, that means that um, the patient um, has um, a bit more radiation uh, in this case, but I think there is still part of a learning curve in it. Um, and you should correct for um, the post-operative CT scans that we make in many of the patients. And what's very important for us for ourselves is that the staff is really being protected for radiation because you can do a very complex intervention with making 10 um, conventional X-rays. And I think that's uh, that's a big benefit for people who have to do this for a pretty long time in the future. So in conclusion, navigated minimal invasive surgery became the treatment of choice in pelvic trauma. Um, the surgical technique is associated with um, safe placements, even in co uh, complex anatomy. Similar operation times, if you compare it with uh, fluoroscopy-guided interventions. Less radiation exposure, I think, in the future um, for patients as well, especially if you start using uh, low-definition scans, but, as, uh, but also for the surgeon. Um, massively reduction of screw misplacements, reoperations, and complications. The only downside um, are the higher costs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Michael. Can you stop your screen share? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Michael, for a clear uh, picture of what is the status of navigation and the benefits of navigation. It is very nice to see that the Navy, as, I mean, uh, unlike popular belief, navigation is uh, uh, known to popularly be used only in arthroplasty, but it's also nice to see that it is also being used a lot in spine surgery and trauma surgery. Dr. Ramesh, do you have any questions on your side? Otherwise, I can go ahead. With I think uh, uh, this was an excellent talk and uh, acetabulum pelvis surgery is gradually coming up in Nepal, but obviously we don't have that navigation system, all those infrastructure to deal with it. So I think uh, on behalf of Nepal Orthopedic Association, I want to thank uh, all of you and all our speakers uh, for sparing your valuable time and speaking to our audience. And uh, thanks to SICOT office for uh, providing us this opportunity to have a live uh, talk from four part of the different world. So thank you, thank you very much. Dr. Ramesh, are we allowed to take a few questions? Yeah, yeah. Sure, yes, sure. sure. Um, my first question is to Dr. Peter. So um, we have to agree that um, there, there is an um, upper limit or a saturation point where until when uh, all the innovations can help us. And finally, it has to reflect on the patient. There has to be benefit for the patient. That should be the crux for us whatever technology we use. All said, also considering that uh, we are working more and more towards enhanced recovery. So do you think surgery and rehabilitation, considering the young surgeons in developing countries, do you think learning the skills and the protocol is getting more and more complicated? So if yes, and if no, what advice or guidance do you have 
with respect to learning the skills in arthroplastic so um my answer would be twofold if you just look at enhanced recovery i do believe that a protocol will fit any surgeon from a young surgeon to to an older surgeon and it's very patient centered the only thing that you will have to keep in mind is that it is a team approach you know the surgeon by himself cannot do that you need to have your anesthetist your physiotherapist your nursing staff your recovery staff everybody on board from the word go from the moment you see the patient until until you discharge the patient with regards to skills for the younger surgeons um the operation in a standard way can become more technical um so for a young surgeon i always feel that you need to learn the basis first before you engage in, in any technological advances because technology is there for us to learn but as we've seen in the cars and we've seen in the presentations as well you know some of the self-driving cars still have accidents or sometimes the navigation switch off so you would always have to be able to 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 uh, get back to your normal um, straightforward standard ways of of doing an operation like hip or knee replacements so don't forget the basics that would be my my message do not forget the basics perfect dr peter thank you so my next question is to dr arvind puri dr puri what short message do you have for the young surgeons to avoid burning fingers when they handle foot and ankle surgeries both in terms of poor healing and also in terms of avoiding infection so i i i personally think for young surgeons they should really have a good knowledge of the anatomy a good knowledge of the vascular supply a good knowledge of the risk factors also if they are going to deal with anything perhaps more complex than what we call as the bread and butter ankle fractures and things like that then they should also understand how they have to address that injury so which then brings you to what approaches to use and how big your incision should be and how do you handle the soft tissue around it so you know making an x-ray look good is not the end all of the surgery the end all of the surgery is that your patient has a functional outcome that they end up getting a foot on which they can walk hopefully as best as they can after whatever injury they have sustained so it's very very important that the young surgeon understand the the anatomy the blood supply the soft tissue relevance the risk factors what the injury is how should we approach and what all things they should try and be careful with to fix it properly perfect the crux message is stick to the basics yes know your basics whatever surgery you are doing or not doing stick to the basics and then go ahead with the advances thank you very much my next question is to dr moya yes as we said innovation is very much important we need to get better and better and the most uh, the best innovation is something that is not getting more and more expensive and is helpful for more and more people and i'm sure uh, shatu dayatar me has done a lot of things that certain surgeries were doing earlier or even surgeries could not do uh, some basic questions about shockwave dayatar me there is a common perception that it is painful do you think so and if so is it uh, what how do you categorize it and do you suggest a standard protocol of shockwave diathermy uh shockwave uh, therapy for all patients undergoing any form of treatment surgical or non surgical for non union of fracture do you recommend shockwave therapy for all such patients okay uh, well generally is not painful there are many 
tricks that you should apply to prevent the patient for, uh, from suffering pain. I have even treated uh, children with non-unions and uh, they tolerated the procedure uh, with no anesthetics. But the point is that there is a wide variety of uh, devices and uh, the feeling that the devices produce during the treatment uh, differ. So uh, we speak generally about shock waves, but there are many options and uh, many sources of shock waves and uh, the level of pain that uh, are produced by different sources uh, may differ. Mm -hmm. So it is the ability of the surgeon to have the chance to get the best device and uh, prevent patients from pain. But you always have the chance to do it under anesthesia. According uh, to uh, the type of patient, the selection of patients, uh, of course, we know that there are two variables, the biological variable and the mechanical variable. So I cannot pretend to uh, give a solution to a mechanical problem with shock waves. We need to have a stable focus of fracture uh, to uh, proceed with shock waves. If not, it's not a good option. And um, on the other hand, a, a gap of less than five millimeters uh, it has a better prognosis. Uh, so there are uh, many variables. If there is an infection, the chance of success is less, uh, the type of bone is uh, influenced on the result. So there are many variables to consider. It's not just using this technique to uh, treat any kind of non union Thank you, Dr. Moya. That was a strong message. We cannot try to replace lack of stability from the implant with shockwave therapy. That's very, very important. That's again, going back to the basics, don't try to replace stability with shockwave or ultrasound therapy or anything else. Just another quick question. There is no interference of the implant with shockwave therapy. Is that right? Uh, no, there is no problem. There is no interaction. Of course, maybe uh, we need to consider that to to consider the approach that we are using because the 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 waves could be uh, diffracted uh, for instance if there is a plate and uh, as you were saying uh, that the make it is important to have experience uh, uh, on dealing with non unions that's why i want to stress that this type of indication should be performed or uh, at least supervised by an orthopedic surgeon that is the professional that has more experience in uh, dealing with fractures and reading x-rays and making decisions about fractures. Yep, I agree. This is similar to asking my first year postgraduate resident to check the instability after ACL reconstruction. So it should not be damaged further, right? So we have to have the best people to monitor. Thank you very much. And the last question to Dr. Tuban. Yeah, uh, we could understand a lot about navigation, the scope of navigation for a lot of uh, subspecialities in orthopedics. Do you think navigation can replace standard surgery in certain regions of orthopedic practice? If so, what are the specialities in which it will have a higher role in future or near future? Yeah, I think uh, I think that's that's the key question. Um, and um, the answer is I don't think um, that navigation can replace anything. I was lucky um, when I started doing this, there was no navigation, so I know how to do it. But um, if you really need to be fast, like in polytrauma patients, unstable hemodynamics, unstable pelvis, you cannot wait for your navigation. So then you have to do it with fluoroscopy. And you have to practice that. And I think for the next generation, like in five years or 10 years, it's really attractive just to start doing navigation. And when you're at night and there is someone bleeding, you don't know what to do. So I think the key thing is you should really start with basics, have everything under control, and then you can start pushing the level up to do more um, 
more fancy stuff, even um, even screws which are t not possible. So I think we should also consider doing totally different screws, different positions uh, that you would normally not do with no, uh, without navigation. Um, and to your second part of the question, I think you can also use this um, um, for other surgery, like for instance in, uh, in ankle surgery, tailor fractures or something like that. If you really have one shot, um, not to damage the bone, uh, you can do a CT scan and try to put it one or two K wires in, select the best one, and then you leave it like that. So I think it will get more and more, um, but you really have to watch out that there is some kind of, uh, of control that um, uh, people don't end up at night as pelvic surgeon without any experience of uh, normal um, uh, normal plating of the symphysis and stuff like that. So I think it's, um, there should be a good uh, control that your um, training is really broad and that you understand the basics first, are able to deal with all the complications. And we still do a lot of open intervention. So it's uh, it's only for the easy um, yep. easier cases. Yeah, uh, we should understand that navigation doesn't give magic powers to do something that we do not know to do by the standard way. Um, what is your recommendation? When should a surgeon start learning navigation? How many years after standard surgeries? I think it depends a lot on the volume of your center. If you're doing spine and, and uh, pelvic surgery every day, um, like um, like here, I think you can start early um, just to get a feeling for it. And you also, it's like you better understand the issue. So I also um, use it if I if we do acetabular plating combined with pelvic um, uh, sacroiliac screws, I put the navigation a bit more to the front so you can check all the screw positions of, the, um, of your acetabular plating um, in the same scan. Um, that you use for your um, um, for your SI screws. So I think you can start in parallel, but it's really important that um, that you fully understand and are able to deal with all the complications. Because if the navigation stops, or um, like old lady who drives in the car with the navigate, uh, we drives in the water when using navigation in the car. Um, that can happen if you have no uh, proper understanding and using such a such a long screw in the body. Yep. Thank you, Dr. Mike Taylor. There is one uh, very interesting question from the audience. Uh, this question uh, is for all the speakers. What should we expect in the future? What is more important, technique or technology? What will be the other? Where is the meeting point? I Dr. think Maya. for... Sorry, uh, Dr. Tuban, please go ahead. I think for our field, it's it's mix and match. I think you you get better technology that makes it more affordable. Uh, radiation gets better. Um, things get cheaper and faster. And then you can also make you can also develop techniques which are not possible without navigation. So it's it's I think it's a combination. Right, Dr. Moya. Yeah, I agree. I agree that the, we must have a balance. And as it was said. Uh, to begin, we must not forget anatomy, we must not forget a clinical examination, and uh, always know why we do things, not just how to do things. Yeah. Dr. Arvind and Dr. Peter, do you have any other comments? Uh, no, I, I certainly agree with what has been said. Technique is certainly really, really important. You have to know your instruments, you have to know how to do things, and the technology is there to perhaps further your efforts. Okay, Dr. Peter. I would I would agree with this. I think the technology is there to support the techniques, not not vice versa. Yeah. Yeah. So we can have a consensus that the basics, the basic the basics, or it's always the basics first the technique first, then definitely, yes, we need technology. We need to get better and better. Definitely technology next. Okay, I think we will conclude the program if Dr. Ramesh does not have any other questions. No, 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 no questions, nothing. Yeah. Thank That's... you very much, Dr. Ramesh. Thank you very much, Dr. Moya, Dr. Puri, Dr. Chubin, and Dr. Peter. It was a wonderful experience speaking to you and learning from you. So, a uh, request to all everyone in the audience, please fill out the post webinar survey in order to give us your feedback and get better and better. And don't forget to join us for the SICOT IOE total hip replacement and complex acetabulum 
Sukkot Pioneer Program. And join Thank us you. in Belgrade for 2024 Sukkot World Congress. Thank you very much. See ya. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much.